Okay, I really needed to record this video because it includes stuff I never remember how to do. It's so basic that I never remember and I always have to look back. So this video, sorry guys, is more for me than for you, but I hope you learn from it. So the main thing is, um, often in seismic papers, and I'm sure you all know how to do this even though I don't, you hear about dominant wavelengths and calculating the resolution of your data. And also I saw in a few places seeing the spectrum of your data. Well, how do you find all of that? So the first thing to do is to calculate, I'm going to call it, I don't know if there's a better word, the period of your data. And so you can see down here, this is um, a seismic line that I've got. And at the bottom here's the section. And I'm going to zoom into one of these areas here where there's good layering. I'm going to click on my plus button and I'm going to zoom in a small square. And so the main thing we want to calculate here for the period is what is the distance between two peaks or two troughs but better yet, what is the distance between two zero crossings? So you, it's this white line here, which is the, diff, um, is the white line is this, between the trough and the peak. And so you can see if I put my mouse um, on the seismic section at the bottom here, it shows T, the time. And so I'm going to hold it um, over a zero crossing between a trough and a peak. And at the bottom, I can see it says 1.462. And in the next crossing below, not between a peak and a trough, but it has to be exactly the same. So it has to have black on top and red at the bottom. Um, here is 1.497. And you could do it the other way. You could have red on top, but it just means when you take your next reading, make sure it's the next one along that has red on top and the black on the bottom. Because you can obviously see if I go here from red on top, black on the bottom, to black on top, red on the bottom, I'm not going from, um, I'm not getting a full wavelength. I hope that makes sense. So I didn't honestly write down these values, I just called out to you, but um, in the survey earlier on today I, I calculated the same period, so I have, this was from, um, I had red on top, and black at the bottom, zero crossing, to red on top, black on the bottom, zero crossing, and so my period is 0 0.028 seconds, and remember that this is two-way travel time. And so the next thing is to calculate your dominant frequency. And so here, um, you would just go one over your period to get your frequency in hertz. So mine is 36 um, hertz. It's not, it's quite low. I think often you'll get 50 to 100, but I'm not an expert. And then next thing to know, what is your dominant velocity in your study area? Now this will vary. I'm just very lucky in my study area. It's, excuse me, it's a large igneous province and the velocities are surprisingly constant. So my dominant velocity, about six seven obviously if you're in a sedimentary area it's going to be different sorry I can't give you more advice than this so you're picking just really the dominant velocity in your survey area and the next thing to calculate the dominant wavelength is you go that velocity divided by 36 and it gives you your dominant wavelength and um, so mine's 186 and then to calculate your vertical resolution you go 186 divided by 4 and I get 47 meters so that means, and I'm calculating this at 1.5 seconds to a travel time, which converts to a depth of about 5 kilometers. And so that means at about 5 kilometers depth, I cannot see a throw on a fault that is less than 50 meters, or a body that is thinner than 50 meters. And so that's how you calculate this vertical resolution. Um, again, remember to get to this depth here, I haven't shown the calculation, but I'm going to take um, my two-way travel time, so say 1.5 seconds, let's get a calculator, 1.5 seconds, I'm going to times it by my velocity, which is 6,700 meters per second, the seconds cancel out, I'm left with meters, but remember it's two-way time, so you have to again divide by two, so that's how I get to five kilometers depth, so that's how you calculate your depth from your velocity. Just a note of caution here, um, like I said, my area is pretty constant, but where I worked for my PhD, it was a sedimentary basin, and so I was dealing all the way from a sedimentary basin, basin with velocities of like 3,500, or was it 5,500 meters per second, to the basement where it's obviously higher, and also your velocity is going to change with depth. So this is a very, it's, it's the dominant one, but it's, it can vary in your area, so just um, do some more work looking into the velocities. If you're having problems with that, message me and I can uh, do a video on at least what I know. Um, and then yeah, just something else I've learned more recently, calculating your signal to noise ratio of your geophones, so it's the square root of the number of geophones you have. 
um, of your source, it's the square root of the number of sources, and then the total signal noise ratio of those two values times multiplied together. Um, I might as well just put this quick figure, figure quickly here. Um, I think most of you probably have way more field experience than me, um, but so often I think I get confused. And so just keep in mind, sorry, getting a bit out of where we want to be, is that you don't just <coughs> have a simple, one is you're doing a very simple survey. Um, when you're dealing with a virus survey, it's a lot more complicated than just a single station and a single station giving you two traces. And so I just wanted to show you what is in my survey area. That's because I've only recently come to understand this because I've never been on a seismic survey. Is that to get this one trace, it's actually made up of um, several data sources coming in. And so you can see for this one trace, I've got 24 ge geophones. It's made up of four different strings with six geophones per string. And you can see they offset each string so that the second um, line of geophones is in between the first line of geophones. Um, so my geophones are about four meters apart, so here it's about two meters apart. And then I've got three vibrosized trucks that are moving along um, at 12 meter intervals, but they kind of between each other. So there's also a spacing of about four, if I've got it right. Um, and so this um, all gets combined to get together to give you this one trace. So just keep in mind that it's a lot more complicated than just um, in these bigger surveys, a lot more complicated than just one geophone over here and someone hitting a hammer, which I think is what I was used to. There really is a whole spread of geophones, um, several different sources um, going on and, and measuring at different times. So yeah, don't forget to look and find out these details for your surveys. They should be in the observer reports if you have them. If not, speak to some scientists that would have worked in that area.